Thank you. Let me make sure the mic is working. Everybody can hear in the back. Raise your hands. Yes. As one of the uh, co-organizers of the conference, I also want to thank all of you for coming for all of this program today. And let me move on to the, the topic that I want to talk about, which is uh, kind of a daring, daring leap uh, to take on this topic, the relationship between development stereotypes and xenophobia. Development stereotypes is something that we've been worried about in development for uh, quite a long time, at least 20 years. There's been a lot of discussion about the problem of creating negative stereotypes about poor people. And negative stereotypes that are inaccurate, that are exaggerated, are of course already themselves xenophobic. Xenophobia is, simply means an irrational fear of foreigners. So if you create an image of a poor foreigner that is exaggerating the threat or uh, other kinds of bad things that the foreigner might bring with them, that is already intrinsically xenophobic. So the, the concentration of this discussion will simply be on the creation of stereotypes. Now I say a research agenda because this discussion and development has been you know, very very illuminating, but it's still not very rigorous. And I'm going to have to confess that's true of my talk today. That's really setting out, it's not going to be very rigorous because we don't have yet the research that we really need to have to, to take on some of the issues I want to talk about. And part of the purpose of this talk is try to inspire many of you in the audience or anyone who I can persuade to do more research on this in a more rigorous way so that we have more, more information. Now fortunately, the the literature in economics has started to talk about some very similar and related issues. First of all, we now have a great paper on stereotypes that just came out this year. That's on the first bullet point here. Where there is a very simple definition of how a stereotype is created. It's, uh, it's based on a trait where a group is overrepresented, even if the incidence of the trait is, is very low. So one that we're going to talk about today is you know, the idea that uh, sort of violence, uh, and the perpetration of violence on a global scale, maybe poor people are overrepresented. So we might have a stereotype of poor people as violent. But of course, the, the true incidence of, of violence among poor people is still a very small minority. Most poor people are not violent. So the, the stereotype is really kind of starting with the true fact that poor people are overrepresented among perpetrators of violence, and then jumping to the false generalization that poor people in general are violent. That's the this creation of the stereotype. Now the second dimension that's kind of emerged in the literature was kind of previewed a, a while ago by a, a really seminal paper by Ed Glazer called The Political Economy of Hatred. And then more recently, at the, and the last bullet point on this slide has been kind of taken up in a much broader context by, by economists and kind of noting that beliefs like stereotypes can be manipulated for political purposes. They're so, they're so easy to create, as we're going to see, and then they can be manipulated for political agendas. And so one of the most obvious ones is that we're now seeing in the current political campaign is you can create negative images of foreigners, this is xenophobia, xenophobic stereotypes, and that is complementary to being opposed to migration policy. So it helps to sort of oppose uh, kind of more open or more free migration policy to kind of perpetrate xenophobic stereotypes. Now I want to tread very carefully here and I don't want to create my own stereotype <laughs> of those who are opposed to migration. Most people who are opposed to migration are not xenophobic. So I don't want to create that stereotype that they are. Of course they're not. Uh, it's very possible to be opposed to migration without being xenophobic. So the focus here is not really on migration, it's on xenophobia. Of course, it is true in the reverse probability that most xenophobes are opposed to migration. <laughs> <laughs> so at the very least, you know, we want to respect anyone's genuine reasons for being opposed to migration, but an irrational fear of foreigners should not, should not be one of those reasons. So the way this has been, well, and the other paper that's cited here that's going to be relevant is uh, there's a paper by Chan and Yana Gisawa that depicts politicians as even being able to manipulate the media. 
which sounds kind of conspiratorial, but it's, it's not that hard to believe that the politicians through kind of the supply of information can actually have an effect on media reporting. Now, the, mi the middle third bullet point here is the most relevant one for, for development. There's long been an issue, as I said, of not, not awareness of stereotypes in development that has been very concerned about this that goes under the, the heading of poverty porn. And let me just jump immediately to a very old statement of poverty porn that really was very influential in kind of raising this as an issue. This was a work by Alex DeWall in 97 called Famine Crimes. And since then, there's been really growing awareness of the pro this problem of poverty porn, which is generally overstating the magnitude of disasters and portraying really extreme situations among poor people as typical. So Alex DeWall in his book gave the example that NGOs tend to make a, a habitual infl inflation of estimates of expected deaths. And he found in many, many sort of NGO brochures that he was studying this phrase, one million will be dead by Christmas. And so please give to avert, you know, one million being dead by Christmas. He said this has been heard every year since 1968, the Biafra famine, and has never been remotely close to the truth. And then of course these are, Poverty porn is also about images. I'm showing you some pretty graphic photographs that have appeared in kind of aid-related literature. And of course, the idea here is very simple, that these photographs and these overestimates are helpful in kind of motivating uh, rich people to give to causes involving poor people. And I don't want again, I don't want to overstate the, the negative of what's going on here. These, these are very well-intentioned well efforts to get rich people to care about poor people, and that's a very good cause. So, you know, this is not, this is not a black and white issue. It's a, it's a very tricky issue to handle. You want to be able to find a way to motivate rich people to care about poor people, yet at the same time, your, your well-intentioned effort to do that will unintentionally create excessively negative images about poor people. And then, of course, that affects xenophobia, and then that it may, in turn, in fact, migration. So what happens in development is not staying in development, may spill over into the migration area, and that's why this talk is in this conference today. So let me give you an example of, of a modern day kind of overstatement of the magnitude of disasters. So, you know, a lot of emphasis in the development world today is on conflict, so we want to know how prevalent is conflict. So here's a World Bank estimate of, of how many people in the world are affected by conflict. Uh, they use this vague phrase, fragile and conflict-affected countries. I'll come back to the word fragile. It's, it's a new euphemism for being in conflict. Development, uh, con development people never want to use a straightforward word like war or conflict. They prefer a vague euphemism like fragile states. But they mean conflict. So their, their estimate in an actual kind of online database of the World Bank is that there's half a billion people affected by conflict. Uh, well, that estimate wasn't good enough for USID. They said, I see you're 0 0.5 billion, I raise you to 1.5 billion uh, are affected by conflict. The World Bank itself was not, com uh, not, not satisfied with its own data point or with the USAID data point. They say, I, 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 I'll call your 1.5 billion, I'll raise it to 2 billion. <laughs> and at that estimate, 17% uh, of the extreme poor live in, in conflict of affected places, and that will rise to 46% by 2030. Uh, not even that was good enough for another NGO named World Vision. They said by 2018, the majority of the extreme poor will live in fragile states, will be affected by conflict. So you see this, even the first number in the bullet point was somewhat exaggerated because it counted everyone who lived in any state affected by where there was any conflict going on. But you see, even that number was not good enough for the cause of advocacy against conflict. So here's some more kind of images, uh, some quick examples of sort of modern day poverty porn. Uh, the World Bank was actually moved to apologize to, to Ghanaians for a display that depicted sort of half-naked women breastfeeding their kids, uh, portraying Ghana's country full of hungry and miserable people. And you know, that's, this is interesting because one at the anecdotal level it also lets us know that one people who really don't like poverty porn about Africa is Africans. And we're going to see there's been a lot of, that's another reason to be concerned about this. Uh, here's a, 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 a recent video by uh, 
Save the Children on the Syria Crisis. This is actually not a, a real life video of conflict. It was a staged video of portraying a British girl with a scary looking gunman in the background about to shoot someone. And this was enormously successful. There were, uh, there were two, two different videos that, that did this. And the first one got 55 million views on YouTube. The second one is already up to 2 million views. So th there's also the agenda, that, the political agenda, that the, the emphasis on conflict in both development in, that's going on in development today is partly motivated by the alliance of development efforts with the war on terror. Development is getting a lot more money from being allied with the war on terror. And so that's another reason why conflict is being so emphasized. And so again, wor the World Vision is really buying in, into this agenda. Uh, you know, they, they say that we want to work in these sort of fragile states that are, again, is a euphemism for just where there's conflict. And they have good motivations for doing this. They show a kind of picture. One of the aspects of poverty porn is that it, it's always showing pictures of little children. <laughs> little children are very overrepresented in NGO brochures. And, um, you know, of course, another reason why maybe this issue is not yet taken as seriously as it deserves to be is a lot of the discussion is about pictures and videos. But of course, it, it would be possible to get this more serious and do research on this. We could digitize the contents of pictures and videos and kind of test some of the, the things that I'm talking about today. Now, the 17% figure in this graph is there may be a political motivation for World Vision em so emphasizing conflict so much, uh, they get 17% of their budget from the US government that wants them to work on conflict because they want to work on the war on terror. So let's just go back to sort of Bayes' theorem to, again, get it really concrete. Uh, the, fir the first sentence here is stating in words the uh, Bayes' theorem, which is relating the probability that uh, most violent people are poor, which could be, which could be true, to the other probability on the left-hand side that most uh, poor people are violent, which is false. So the reason that the two are so, are so different from each other is because the probability of violence, the second term, is of course very low in general in the world. And so that is what creates the stereotype that once you believe that most violent people are poor, you start believing most poor people are violent. So here's some examples from so development advocates. This is like Bob Geldof in, in 2007 saying, you know, Africa is just taken over by, completely by war, famine, plamin, plague, and death. This was a, another viral video on, on the war, horrible warlord Joseph Kony that got over 100 million views in, in 2012. The only problem with this video is the war that Joseph Kony had started was already over in northern Uganda, and Joseph Kony was 1,000 miles away from northern Uganda when this video was released. And then to show you that it does affect kind of serious development economists, here's a statement by Paul Collier, who's a very serious development economist. Africa coexists with the 21st century, but the reality is the 14th century civil war, plague, ignorance. Now again, I'm, I'm confessing to you that it's not completely rigorous, but this sounds to me like a stereotype about Africa. Uh, uh, you're welcome to disagree in the Q&A session. Uh, what's the true picture of how violent Africa is? This is the number of war deaths, and this is also relevant to all those conflict estimates that I showed earlier, the number of actual war deaths from war and terrorism per 100,000 population. It reached a brief peak in 99 when there were a couple of wars going on. And since then, it's hovered at a stable figure of around three deaths per 100,000 population. So it's not exactly like most Africans are caught up in, in violent conflict. Uh, the deaths worldwide from all war, terrorism, and violence are a little over 100,000. The implied death rate, even in the most conflict-afflicted areas, is about six per 100,000. So even in those fragile states that the World Bank was, conf was concentrating on, even in those states, your probability of actually dying in a war is a lot lower than most people think. Again, that's creating an excessive stereotype about how much poor people are themselves either victims or perpetrators of violence. By comparison, the death rate from just driving around New York City is more than twice the probability of dying in a war in a conflict area. Uh, so the media is also getting, getting sort of caught up in this. Let me, I need to speed up here, so let me quickly jump over this. The New York Times wrote an article about the migration crisis in which they 
they seem to give some kind of remarkably stereotypical images. Large areas of sub-Saharan Africa are becoming uninhabitable. Uh, that's just a real, ridiculously wild generalization. The, the, another quote was, the whole global south is on the move. So what's the actual number of refugees? So again, the, the antidote to stereotypes is just over and over again, as serious economists, we can just go to the real data. What's, what's the real data? So sub-Saharan Africa, the percent of the population that are refugees has been going down, is now about 0.5%, which is also true about, of the world as a whole. There is, of course, a larger refugee problem in the Middle East and North Africa, but it's been around for a long time. It's not new. There's always been a lot of refugees in the, in the Middle East and North Africa, and it's still only about 2.5% of the population. So how does this translate into immigration stereotypes? Now, Paul Collier has sort of helped out, hel helpfully kind of offered himself as a great example. So sorry, I don't mean to be not mean to Paul Collier. He's a, he's a, does a lot of good work in development economics. He's written a lot of good academic articles, but I'm going to be mean to him anyway, because I have an agenda. <laughs> uh, so he, he wrote this book that George Borjas quoted uh, after writing the first book about creating an Africa picture of its being in the 14th century. He wrote an, helpfully wrote another book about immigration stereotypes in which he said, well, Jamaican murder rates are 50 times higher than in Britain's, and then made this kind of gen stereotypical generalization that guns are normal, Jamaican immigrants bring them with them. What is the actual murder rate that he's talking about in Jamaica? It's 0.00045 of the population. So the idea that most Jamaicans are violent or most Jamaican immigrants are violent, again, is just not you know, way out of touch with reality. I'll skip over the Nigerian stereotype for lack of time. Here's a more positive stereotype, or it's actually not a stereotype, this is real data. 49% of African immigrants to the US are college educated, which is higher than any other ethnic group in the whole sample. And uh, terrorism is also, a, you know, it's a, of course an enormously politically explosive issue, but the actual death counts is a lot less than you think. It's, for the world as a whole, it's two deaths per million population. And you think, oh, but most of that isn't, isn't the most of that in the US and Western Europe where it creates political havoc? Well, actually, the, the, the pie chart of all deaths from global terrorism worldwide, I mean, of course, anyone who does die in a terrorist attack or any of their families or relatives, of course, th they deserve enormous amounts of sympathy and compassion. But we should also not overstate the problem for reasons of a political agenda. Most terrorist deaths are, are the vast, vast majority of terrorist deaths are not happening in Western Europe or, or the US. We should be showing a lot more sympathy to other places that are suffering much worse terrorism problems. So who are, who are the terrorists? Well, I'm going to skip over this mostly. This is this sort of hot, really super hot topic. So I'm going to give you the sort of obvious uh, e education, which I'm sure you already know, that there could be a high probability that most terrorists are Muslim. This seems to be confirmed by the most recent data. But it's certainly not true that most Muslims are terrorists. The probability is, again, that only something like 0 0.00035. So if you're sitting next to some guy on a plane who looks like a Muslim and is writing uh, you know, Arabic-looking scary slogans on a piece of paper in front of you, uh, this is an actual real-life situation. Uh, well, a, pers a person sitting next to this person reported to him for being a suspicious Muslim writing uh, scary you know, slogans on his piece of paper. Actually, this guy was not Muslim at all. He was an Italian economist at the University of Pennsylvania writing differential equations <laughs> on, on a piece of paper. His name is Guido Menzio. <laughs> so um, I'll skip over this because we're almost out of time. Yes, one minute left. So uh, I'll finish with kind of a, a uh, well, I do want to show you one other sort of uh, counter, counter stereotypical image. Uh, the other thing that keeps changing over time is who are the terrorists? So in the, in the 70s, it was the IRA were the terrorists. And in the, in the 1980s, it was Latin American terrorists, like the Shining Path, the Nicaraguan Contras that we ourselves were supporting in, in the US. And it's only been recently that, that most of the terrorist deaths have been, have been associated with Muslim, Muslim fundamentalist groups. So now I have very little time left, so I'm just going to give you a, a kind of uh, a, more, a somewhat lighter finish to this, a, a dueling tale of two songs. So the first song is a song that came out in 1984, Do They Know It's Christmas, featuring Bono, Sting, and Paul McCartney. Uh, it, it was meant at first to, 
to uh, deal with the Ethiopia famine, but it was released again in 1989, 2004, and 2014. They somehow thought the 30th anniversary of this song was worth commemorating. Uh, here's, here is the album cover of the song that uh, shows the stereotypical image of you know, emaciated children in Africa being tormented by flies, a really awful, extreme image. And the lyrics uh, about Africa were, where nothing ever grows, no rain or rivers flow. Uh, I, I hope you know enough about Africa to know that actually there, are, there is rain in Africa. <laughs> uh, there are rivers in Africa. So this seems to be an extreme case of really uh, exaggerating the scale of the problem. And last of all, they, do they know it's Christmas time at all? This was about Ethiopia. Uh, the majority of Ethiopian are Orthodox Christians, they do actually know when it's Christmas. So that hadn't previously been thought to be a big development issue that people didn't know when it was Christmas. Um, so, you know, still in 2014, the lyrics are just as bad. There's a world outside your window, and it's a world of dread and fear, a song of hope where there's no hope tonight. And Bono still doesn't know that they know it's Christmas. Um, so the, the rejoinder to this was, uh, was wonderful. A group of African musicians did a, a, a parody video of aid from Africa to Norway to deal with freezing children in Norway. <laughs> uh, in Norway, kids are freezing. You know, a very stereotypical image of Norway that all the children are freezing. And now it's Africa for Norway. We have to help the freezing children in Norway. That's the, the best rebuttal ever of, of poverty porn and extreme stereotypes. So to finish up, the, the kind of first hypothesis here is that development advocacy does have an incentive to exaggerate negative images of poor people, which create stereotypes that are intrinsically xenophobic. And the second hypothesis is that what happens in development doesn't stay in development. It can be affecting migration debates also. So, you know, the usual conclusion that we do need a lot more research on this that's more rigorous that, about all of this stuff that, that is covered by these two hypotheses. But even before that research, I think it's pretty obvious that we ourselves as, as academics, as intellectuals, as people who, who deal in knowledge, accurate knowledge, that we ourselves are obliged to correct the stereotypes as much as we can. And indeed, most poor people are just trying to make a better life for themselves. Thank you very much. Okay, I ran a little bit over, so we're going to have to cut, have a little bit shorter Q&A, so, but please, yeah, go ahead. Uh, if you have a question, just come to the, come to the microphone, yes. If you want to make it faster, just, if anyone else has a question, just come to a microphone, then I'll call on you quickly. Hi, yes, please, go ahead. can mobilize people to care in, in a less offensive way, and that once we get people to care, how we can translate that compassion into some more effective action, because it seems, based off your presentation, that what you're largely saying is caring isn't enough if it's going to lead to an ineffective response and it's going to perpetuate these stereotypes. So I was wondering if yeah. you could provide that. Yeah, th well, something. thank you for that question, because that's really at the heart of the whole kind of stereotypes and poverty porn debate. So I. So I've actually been myself writing on this issue for almost 10 years now, and, and with both academic articles and op-eds and so on. And people often ask this question, well, isn't it kind of allowed in a good cause to get more rich people to care about, about poor people by maybe just you know showing the most extreme cases? Because that's what you need to do to get to kind of get poor peop rich people out of their lazy indifference towards poor people, and so, you know, isn't that justified? Well, first of all, you know, I think we're, we're all required in spreading information to portray accurate information, and that's kind of a, a core value. And second, that, you know, so, but, you know, I also want to concede there are very good motivations, and this is not a black and white issue. There is no easy answer. There are trade-offs towards effective advocacy, and you know, creating stereotypes. It's, a, it's not, there's just no simple, easy out. But it, but it does do damage to create negative stereotypes. I, it's resented very much by the people who are themselves the victims of stereotypes. I mean, I'm, 
was born in West Virginia. I hate stereotypes about West Virginia. I can vouch for that personally. <laughs> there are a lot of them out, to, out there involving, you know, incest and moonshine and feuding and so on. And, you know, those were not prominent features of my family history, so I don't really like those stereotypes. Uh, nobody likes stereotypes. And I think there's, they're intrinsically, intrinsically bad in themselves. And, I, and there actually have been efforts to, among the NGO community, to write codes restricting NGOs from, u from doing extreme poverty porn. So this issue is being increasingly recognized, but as we saw in these examples, still not, still not enough. Yes, Vivek. Hi, um, I'm thinking of the uh, wonderful African rebuttal to, uh, do they know it's Christmas? And obviously the internet offers a, a lot of possibility for, possibilities for Africans to reclaim these offensive narratives that have been sort of created in the West. Um, but do you see that happening uh, in a big way, um, especially in terms of changing Western perspectives about Africa? Yeah, I mean, th this is a good question. You know, us development people often live in our own bubble, and we think, oh, we're, we're all talking a lot about poverty porn and fighting stereotypes, and people, <coughs> people are starting to listen. And then, you know, the, the guy who created the Coney 2012 campaign who was suffering from a bad case of white savior complex uh, comes along and does a, a, a video that goes viral, or sa even Save the Children, which has been kind of a, a notorious offender, despite all these criticisms, will release that video that I showed you that goes viral, and then we realize, well, you know, we don't have as much impact as we think we, we're having. Uh, and, you know, that raises a big question, how could we have more impact in kind of trying to fight these stereotypes and trying to get people to behave, not to, 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 not to use these to raise money for your own organization. You know, that, that really should be something that we're all trying a lot harder on, but I, I'm at a loss to know how to do better. Uh, yes, please. Yeah, uh, good morning. Uh, you know, we're, we're here today dealing with xenophobia and racism and migration and so forth. And uh, all of these are the effects of our, uh, the results of when we allow the oppressors to uh, control the, the means of, of uh, the media. Everything that we, the people, receive comes through the media and is owned and controlled by powerful people. And I think the last time I was here, Professor, I, I suggested to you that you, to do something with this, with, uh, be a good neighbor, and by you be a good neighbor to the community. Bring in people from our community and have the expertise and the experience of what you <coughs> men are talking about. You do research and you, you clinically uh, look at the, 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 the issues that are that's dominating the world and destroying poor nations and poor people. And you don't have the people that have the experience who live these lives and, and understand what these things are all about to come up there and address them. And we keep seeing the same folks the okay. same academic folks who come <laughs> and sanitize in a sanitized way to give okay. up graphs and charts I, and thank you. Us thank you. I, I, no, wait, no, no, wait. I have to. I have to cut you off because if I let all of this go on a lot longer, I'm going to cut into the time of my wonderful Ghanaian colleague Yao and Yarko. Yeah, but the problem is no, last no, night. I'm sure last night it was addressed. We have to last address, night was addressed in that, that great contradiction last night. Yeah. It, they brought up the issue. Of, uh, of refugees, I, I and uh, you I folks don't want to discuss the reason as to why there are refugees in the world. You have countries such as the thank United you, States you, and the other you. European nations that are creating raging wars in these people's country. You have, change, you have a regime change, you do no man of evil, and you're displacing millions of people throughout the world. And you're not addressing these issues. People okay. don't want can to I, leave their own country to go to the next, can and I, the U.S. Can they I want I to stay in their own country and to be able to reap the benefits of what the country produces. Can I, let me answer. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. So I actually agree with a lot of what you're saying. I think another problem is that we're very naive about the political power behind the, the development, you know, the development efforts. And I didn't have time to discuss this, but uh, I mentioned the alliance between the war on terror and uh, the development agenda. The development agenda is driven excessively by political considerations that are themselves a function of the war on terror. And of course, that's also 
We also need to recognize that a lot of the refugees and the, the migration crisis was itself created by things like the U.S. invasion of Iraq that destabilized an entire region and never should have happened. So yes, I, I agree with you on that. So let's... let's well, they no, okay, you okay, okay you've had enough. The next, the next person has the last question. But thank you for your comment. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yep. Um, my main concern is how does one deal with the negative rhetoric um, against Muslims, um, this negative rhetoric of Islamophobic? Um, I've heard rhetoric like the Islamization of Germany because of the large refugee flow into Germany. Um, this rhetoric really is not helpful for young Muslim youth and children all over the world. How do we counter this negative rhetoric against Muslims, against Islam itself? Whenever there's a terrorist attack anywhere in the world, the first thing people automatically assume there must be an Islamic connection. That's not true. How do we counter this negative rhetoric, yeah. namely Islamophobia? Thank you. Yeah, well, thank you for that question. And this is this has to be the last question because we need to move on to Yao's presentation. But um, you know, it's it's frustrating how hard it is to combat. Uh, you know, the what we can do as academics and public intellectuals and advocates is just continually reiterate again and again accurate information. You know, when when uh, you know a, a very prominent voice is saying Africa is emptying out and you know, showing a map of Europe with arrows pointing towards it as if it's a military invasion coming from Africa, you know, show the statistic that, you know, the percent of refugees in Africa is 0.5% of the population. And even that is an exaggeration because a lot of them have been in the same refugee camps for a long time and are not trying or intending to move to Europe. So, you know, the portrayal, and even more on Muslims, of course. Uh, and the most important thing, I, th I think, you know, the real problem there is not whether the perpetrators of terrorist attacks are Muslim, you know, because of course sometimes they are. The problem then is jumping from that to the, you know, uh, the false inverse probability that, uh, that you think most Muslims are therefore terrorists. And that's just, you know, wildly untrue when you realize even if all the terrorists were Muslim, the fact that terrorism itself is so rare a phenomenon in the general population that there's, you know, and so the, the, the orders of magnitude is, you know, there's a few tens of thousands of terrorists that belong to these various organizations like ISIS and Al-Qaeda and Al-Shabaab, and there's 1.6 billion Muslims in the world. So that's, you know, this, this is the scale of the problem, and you report over and over again the accurate information on the way things work. Of course, we know that uh, the, this talk itself stressed that these uh, images are put out there for political agendas, and that's what we're fighting against. But let's let's keep fighting.